The College of Menominee Nation and the Oneida Arts Program present Little Boy Lost, Stupid Indian by Lewis V. Clark III, Two Shoes. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and came upon a strange and wonderful land. In 1493, Columbus wrote to Lord Rafael Sanchez, one of his benefactors, describing the native people that he encountered. These are his words. They are very simple and honest and exceedingly liberal with all they have, none of them refusing anything he may possess when he has asked for it. But in his log, Columbus wrote, all of the inhabitants could be taken away or made into slaves on the island. Stupid Indian. Hi, I'm David Smith and I'm an Indian. All right, maybe I don't look like an Indian, no feathers, but wait, 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 wait. Sagoli, in English, that means how. Which means hi or hello. I'm Indian, stoic. No feathers, keep birds warm. Mother, environmentalist. Me, strong, manly, with one tear coming down cheek. Wait, wait, that was some Italian guy dressed up like an Indian. Immigration problems since 1492. But I wasn't always an Indian. When I was younger, I was Superman. Strange being from a distant planet. Faster than an older sister who wants to kill him. More powerful than her new boyfriend who I locked out of his car. Able to leap mom's rose bushes in a single bound. Well, almost always. My sisters always told me that I was adopted. My parents were good people, but they both had drinking problems. And they always were fighting. My sisters always fought. So bottom line, I was happy to think that I was adopted. I didn't like the fight. I was Superman. Sent here to fight for truth, justice, and the American way. But which way was that? And who's America? Oh well, something happened to me. I lost my powers. Kryptonite, I bet you. Gold kryptonite. Gold kryptonite robs you of your powers. I read that in a comic book. From my side of the block, comic books were about as factual as some of the history books I've seen. David. Yes, Mom. David, sit down. I want to talk to you. David, I want you to know that we bought a new house and we're moving to the reservation. But I like this house. What's a reservation? Why can't I stay here? A reservation is where the Indians live. You'll like the new house better. Another trail of tears. Mom was Andrew Jackson and Dad was William Clark forcing the Cherokee out of Georgia. Forced relocation from my house to the res, to the heart of the res. I didn't know that I already lived on the res, and they didn't even tell me that I was an Indian. I didn't know. No feathers, no teepees. Dad didn't wear a loincloth. One would have thought that they would let me in on that secret. I want you to be nice to the Indians. Extra nice. You're a special little boy. You have to act in a special way. You can't brag about the things that you have. You have to share the things you have, and you have to be quiet around grown-ups. Okay, behave, be good, and be quiet. I got it, Mom. Hi, are you an Indian? <whistles> Hi, hello, are you an Indian? <whistles> Hi, my name's David. I just moved to the reservation. Are you an Indian? Ah! Mother! You should see what your son is doing. David. Yes, Mom? What are you doing? I'm asking people if they're Indians. If they are, I'm going to be nice to them. But they all look like people to me. Oh, I caught hell for that. But how was I to know? We all look alike, I've heard it said. Nobody had buckskins or feathers. Me have them idea. Me make them big money. Write book. Explain Indian humor. I'm sure they didn't think that I was funny either. I didn't know that I was an Indian. No one told me. I met two friends. Mom said that they were Indians. We used to compete, baseball, football, and seeing who could pee the furthest off the sand cliffs. That's why I didn't think that I was an Indian. We looked different, and they teased me. I won't, won't go into that, but later in life, I figured I must be Suish, one of the lost tribes, you know. 
Anyway, it came time to go to school. My Indian friends were bussed off the reservation, and I, in my red bow tie, black pants, and white shirt, was sent to the Catholic school on the reservation. Everybody rise and put your hand over your heart. You, the little boy with the black hair. Me, sister? Yes, you. Now watch. You put your right hand over your heart. Your heart is on the left side of your chest. Yes, sister. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag and, and to, to the, the United, United States, States of, of America, America and to the Republicans for which it stands, one nation under God, invisible with liberty and justice for all. I didn't really know what this pledge was about. As far as I knew, it had something to do with dusting the living room tabletops. My mom used pledge. And what was this invisible? Was God invisible? When I learned later that I was an Indian, I thought maybe it meant that Indians were invisible when it came to liberty and justice for all. And it's only for Republicans? Mom, mom, mom. What is it, David? Mom, what does pledge allegiance mean? Ask your father. He was in the war. Dad, what does pledge allegiance mean? It means that you are willing to stand up for what is right, even if you have to suffer for it. How do you know what is right? That's a hard question. I guess you don't always know what is right, but pretty much you'll know in your heart. It's on the left side. What? Sister says that your heart is on the left side of your chest. Oh, I guess inside you. You come to know what is right or wrong, and hopefully you are right. You have to always try to do what is right. Fight for what is right. My dad fought in World War II in Korea. Heck, <laughs> he was always ready to fight. He was always ready to fight and to drink. I'm kind of torn about that one. If it wasn't for his drinking, I would never really have known the man. When he drank enough, he would tell stories, good stories. After he died, I went to the veteran services and got a copy of his service record. He won a bronze star. He never got drunk enough to tell that story. And he told stories about Indians. There were good Indians, the ones who worked hard, and there were bad Indians. I don't remember him saying that there were good whites and bad whites, but I remember he often said that a lot of whites thought that they were better than everyone else. Give him enough beer and he'd tell everyone what he thought. Maybe that's why he was always ready to fight. Mom, Mom! What, David? Sister Mary's first grade teacher says that when you pray, you have to fold your hands with the fingers pointing up so God can see what, that you want to go to heaven. And your question is? Mom, Mom, when Dad folds his hands, his fingers are pointing down. Does that mean he wants to go to H-E double toothpicks? Probably, so he can be with his friends. What, Mom? Nothing. You just be a good boy and study hard. Columbus left Europe to come to America and save the heathen savages, to spread Christianity to all the lands. We had to baptize the heathen savages so that when they die, they could all go to heaven. Sister, who are the heathen savages? Well, the Indians, of course. And it's your job, our job, to convert them to Christianity so their souls won't burn in hell or have to stay in limbo for eternity. I didn't know what the hell limbo was. I thought that it was a dance. And I was the best limbo dancer on the res. Every limbo boy and girl then would start to rain. Go figure. But that didn't make no sense to me. If you're not baptized, you're forced to dance with Chubby Checker for eternity. And then how was I supposed to tell my new friends that I met on the res, Hey, you're heathen savages who are going to hell unless I baptize you. How was I supposed to do that? Six years old and I felt like a total failure. I couldn't even save my grandma and grandpa. I knew that they were Indians, but you can't tell your grandma and grandpa that they're going to hell. Grandpa was already dead. I couldn't save him. And I still didn't know that I was an Indian. Nobody told me. You're heathen. You're savage. Who? Me? Yeah, you. My dad says that you're an Indian. So sister says Indians are heathens and savages. So you must be a heathen savage and you're going to hell. No, no, you're wrong. I'm not an Indian. I'm Superman. 
and I came here to fight for truth, justice, and the American way. That's when I first learned to fight. Stupid Indian, stupid Indian, you think you're smart? You're not so smart. That just led to fight after fight. Stupid, stupid Indian, Indian, stupid Indian, stupid Indian. Mom? Yes, David. Am I an Indian? Why do you ask, David? The kids at school said that I was an Indian. Well, David, I'm an Indian, and your dad is Polish, so I guess you're half Indian. Am I a stupid Indian? Do they call you that, too? And they said I was a heathen and a savage who's going to hell because I'm not a Christian. No, David, you're none of those things. You're a very special little boy. I thought that you said we are supposed to be nice to Indians. We're supposed to be nice to the Indians. Then why aren't they nice to me? You know, we all get sad sometimes. When I got down, Mom would buy me a Superman comic book. They were only 12 cents a piece. We only needed to find six pop bottles to redeem them for the deposit money, and we were able to buy a comic book. My parents didn't need the pop bottles. They were rich. Well, rich for where we lived. Mom was this big, beautiful lady. She had dreams. When she was 14, she left the reservation to live and work for a rich family in Green Bay so she could attend high school. She learned how to make these. They're delicious. You put milk and sugar in your tea. Then you take some saltine crackers and butter the unsalted side. You make a saltine sandwich. Dip it in the tea and let the butter melt. Oh, a little piece of heaven right here on earth. Mom and Dad worked all the time. She was a waitress and she cleaned houses, rich people's houses. I had to go along and sit, behave, be good, and be quiet. Dad was a painter and he'd take me along sometimes to talk with the old ladies or play with the little kids. Had to behave, be good, and be quiet and keep the old ladies and the kids out of his hair. We lived in make-believe world. Mom and Dad would dress up like Desi and Lucy from the I Love Lucy show and go out all the time. Then they come home and fight. But on the reservation, we were always haunted. Dad got into a lot of fights because of the white world. A lot of men made passes at mom. I don't think that they respected her. And in our Indian world, a lot of our Indian friends died and it seemed normal. One Sunday afternoon, we chased the screaming police cars. That's something we used to do on a long time ago because we had to know what was going on. One of our Indian friends decided to stand in the train tracks and let the train run them over. No one ever said why. It was just accepted. Another person drowned in a kiddie pool. It happened. No one ever said why. It seemed like it was normal, but none of our white friends ever seemed to just die unless they were really old. So I thought that maybe I'd rather not be an Indian. It was Monday, November 18th, 1963 more learning that I didn't want to be an Indian. David Smith? Mr. David Smith? Come here, please. Yes, Sister Mary, whatever your name was, because I'm afraid to say it because you might have connections in heaven. But I'm a heathen who's going to hell anyway, so I shouldn't be afraid to say it, but I am. Mr. Smith, you go with Father. He will take you to the Indian Mission down the hill to get your vaccination. Yes, Sister, what's a vaccination? It's so you don't get polio. Me want to say, me no got no horse, so me can't play polio. Horse probably drown anyway. I didn't know that they were rounding up all the Indian kids on the reservation and branding them with a needle. This won't hurt at all. It's for your own good. Be a man. If it won't hurt, why are all those kids over there crying? Indian kids. I don't want to be an Indian if you're going to make me cry. And I'm not a man. I'm just a little kid. And I don't see any men standing on the side of the needle anyway. It's good for you. Why are only Indian kids here? I'm half white. I don't want to. That's right, nurse. He is only half Indian. Only do one arm. Yes, father. They lied. Go figure. It did hurt. 
I didn't cry though. Did they vaccinate your right arm? No, father. They did to my left arm. Then why are you holding your right arm? I watch television, father. Leave it to Beaver, Dennis the Menace. I know what's going to happen when I get back to school. Everybody will punch me in my sore arm to see how tough I am. Oh, I see. I checked out my parents and my sister's arms. Only mom and me had been branded. My sisters were light-skinned like my dad. I looked like my mom. In my little boy mind, I couldn't understand why they were rounding up all the Indian-looking people. Rollin', 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 get the engines rollin', redskin. I felt like cattle from a John Wayne movie, or maybe like one of Dad's drunken World War II stories about the Jews being rounded up and branded. What's next? Extermination? No wonder they named baseball and football teams after us. Not much different than the Texas Longhorns that they rounded up and branded. It makes sense. Then the week got worse. November 22nd, 1963. I have some very sad news, children. Our president, John F. Kennedy, has just been killed. Let's all say a silent prayer. I look around and people were crying. The nuns were crying. He was so young to be killed. I wonder if he was vaccinated. There are moments in time that everyone who was alive remembers. Remembers where they were and what they were doing. It was a bit different for me. My mom was a head hostess at the only private golf club in our town. That night was going to be the end of the season employees party. Nobody much wanted to party. You know those big two gallon glass pickle jars? Mom brought home three of those glass jars packed with lobster meat. No shells, just meat. I was the only one in the family who liked the taste. I had my friends over, my Indian friends, and they said it tasted like bullheads. We don't eat any bullheads or fish off our reservation. Only the white people eat the fish out of our river. The Indians see the white people run their septic systems into the river. The waters are polluted. Indians stay away from the river. David. Yes, Mom? Did you go into the river? I had to, Mom. What did I say about that river? That it's like swimming in your toilet bowl. But all the white kids swim there, and I had to help one of the white boys get their fishing line unstuck. I don't care what all the white kids do. If all the white kids jumped off that bridge, would you jump too? I wanted to say yes. Well, maybe. I don't know. Sometimes I just wanted to fit in, not to be different. I'd probably jump. You stay away from there. You know that people are going to think you're a stupid little Indian if you swim in that septic water. Yes, Mom. I never heard anyone call the white boys stupid. Oh well, back to my candy story. I ate lobster for three weeks, but I never went swimming on the reservation. Then one night, I heard Mom tell Dad about one of her waitresses. Seems that this waitress would hide a small bottle of booze in her purse and go and take a drink once in a while. Mom thought that it was a game. It was a white man's game, and we didn't know how to play. This is when my mom began to disappear. See these books? The good folks in town donated these books to our library. In 1968, Catholics became full human beings according to our Constitution. We were now allowed to ride the big yellow school buses. There were two Catholic schools on the reservation, we both rode the same bus, and guess which idiot decided to be the only Indian on the bus? You got it. That was me. Well, maybe I wasn't the only Indian, but I was the only one who stuck out like a sore thumb. Or maybe I was the only one with a big mouth. Want to fight? No, I don't want to fight. It's not really fighting. It's wrestling. Indian wrestling, like on Daniel Boone on television. No one will get hurt. That reminds me, Kendi started the Peace Corps, but there was also something similar to sending kids to foreign lands right here in the United States. It was called Vista, and a bunch of college kids came to our reservation to teach us to be white. They were good people, I'm sure, but they tried to start a Boy Scout troop, and they told us that the Boy Scouts were patterned after Daniel Boone. 
they weren't too smart because Daniel Boone was supposed to be this great Indian fighter. We didn't need any more people with that thought process. Mom won't let me go. Oh, they did teach me how to dunk for apples at the Halloween party, so I did learn something. Anyway, I said, okay, but just wrestling. Another white man's promise. No one will get hurt. I must be no one, nobody. Hey, maybe they were honoring me when they said nobody knows. Maybe I knew. Well, anyway, he folded me up like a shirt that you buy from Sears and Roebuck store. You know, the kind of shirt that Custer had on at Little Bighorn, an arrow shirt. Then he stuffed me between the seats and beat the living snot right out of me, calling me a stupid Indian. I staggered off the bus and my favorite hiding tree was naked, just like I felt. I went into the house and crawled underneath the kitchen table. David, where are you? Great, she's drinking again. David, are you home? What are you doing under the kitchen table? What happened to your shirt? Your shirt's torn. That was a brand new shirt. And for the price of a stupid shirt, Mom called up the bus company and took out a contract on my life. I felt like Joe Valachi, the first mafia guy to turn evidence over to the FBI. Everyone was out to get me. Every day I'd get on the bus and I'd hear, the bus driver, a big farm lady, made Daniel Boone sit in the front seat of the bus. All of his friends sat up there with him, and every day they'd point at me and say, Your, Your time's, time's coming. coming. I'm gonna get you. Then one day I got on the bus, and like in the movie The Sword and the Stone, when Arthur pulls the sword from the stone and the heavens open up, well, there was nobody sitting in the front seat saying, I'm gonna get you. I was so happy when I sat down, then I heard a whisper in my ear. I'm gonna get you. And pow! He hit me right in the back of the head. I started to scream like a real television Indian. Yeah! I jumped over the seat, landed on his lap, and pow! Bam! Boom! I was beating the living daylights out of him. The bus driver lady pulled me off and said she was going to throw us off the bus. I was screaming that I was going to finish him off in the ditch and I took off running toward the front of the bus. She tackled me before I could make my escape. I got to sit by her for the next three years. She was a nice lady. Twelve years later I married her niece. Back at school books saved my life. There was the Count of Monte Cristo. I learned about revenge and how it can destroy many lives, but I still like to let it play in my head. Don Quixote. The song was on the radio, The Impossible Dream from The Quest. The book was too hard to understand for me at the time, but I was willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. Made a profound impact on me. Then that stupid book, Romeo and Juliet. I had an Indian tongue, and I couldn't do those th 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 this thises but thought would light three on her window break. I felt like Sylvester the Cat attempting to talk like that. But the books did save my life. And then there was football. What do you want for Christmas, David? A football. Again? You got a football last year. And you got one for your birthday. They were out. Football was something that I was good at. At school, we had eight grades in the school, two grades per room. And the fifth graders always played against the sixth graders, while the seventh graders played against the eighth graders. We play grind the dirt in your face tackle. One day the eighth graders asked me to play on their team and I was only in the fifth grade. I intercepted a pass and ran in for a touchdown. <laughs> when I turned to walk out, one of the seventh graders kicked me in the thigh and I did a complete flip landing on my back. Stupid Indian, go back where you belong. It must have been the seventh grade quarterback. On the one hand, it was an honor. I was always getting beat up if I did something good. Maybe not getting beat up, but people got mad at me. So I did what many young people do to fit in. I just quit being good. It was better to come in second, just to prove I could, than to come in first and have people dislike me. When you come in second, people always console you for doing your best. But I never did my best, except in football. I don't think I walked right for a week. Okay. We'll play football, but Smith can't be quarterback. 
We got around this rule by having me play an end position. At the snap of the ball, I'd run backwards and take a handoff from the quarterback, and then I'd throw the ball. That's cheating! I had to explain that it wasn't cheating. Heck, the college all-stars of the 1963 did basically the same thing to beat the world champion Green Bay Packers 20-17. to Then somebody grabbed me from behind, and this big sixth grader kept jumping on my head until my eyes started to leak. There's your trick plays, you stupid Indian. I'm not very bright. I love football. I was good. I just didn't have any brains. It seemed that every day my team would be winning, and then, and then, somebody would grab me from behind, and this big kid would jump up and down on my head. Family secrets. Not my family. It seemed that we didn't have any secrets. We fought loud and proud. Well, my parents, friends, enemies, and sisters did. I laid low, but small communities have many stories, but I wasn't allowed to repeat them, so I always wished that I was white. It didn't seem like there was anything that a white kid couldn't say. At night, I lay in my bed and cry and beat up on my pillow, pretending the pillow was that big kid who always jumped on my head. I could have hurt him with the stories or words, true stories, true words, but I was raised not to. One day an eighth grader, the one who asked me to play football on their team, just walked up to the monster guy and hit him in the throat and said, leave Smith alone. And he did. But I just wasn't smart enough to quit doing my best at football. Then freedom beckoned and I was sent to play football at Seymour High School. I was going to be a Seymour Indian. Indians was the name of their sports teams. See more. I was going to be Paul Horning, the greatest running back of all time. An Indian Paul Horning. I had the best arm on the reservation, I thought. So I should probably win the varsity quarterbacking job once the coach gets to see how good I am. The Seymour Indians varsity quarterback fades back. He looks, he looks, and deep down the field, the receiver breaks free. The ball is in the air. And from out of nowhere, freshman phenomenon David Smith playing safety cuts in from the receiver and picks off the pass. Smith races up the field like Paul Harning smelling the goal line, eluding tackler after tackler. Yep, I did that in one of our first practices. I was special because I got to practice with the varsity. Or maybe we just didn't have enough players. It would have been a pick six if coach hadn't blown his whistle. My freshman teammates mobbed me. We were screaming, we're not going to be everybody's homecoming opponent no more. Indians don't always lose. I was wrong. Hey, you! A giant red-headed offensive lineman came walking into the freshman locker room. He was ten foot tall and his knuckles dragged on the ground. No, really, at least 10 feet tall. Hey, you! He was looking straight at me. I was hoping, no, I was praying, I learned that in Catholic school. I was praying that he was going to congratulate me on a great play. Hey, you! Very talkative, you might notice. Hey, you! Take my shoes off! Then he hit me in the head. Why does everyone always hit me in the head? He sat down on the bench in front of me and said, Take my shoes off now! One thing I learned about being an Indian is that we have a really weird senses of humor. I was going to say that I didn't have his shoes on, but instead I took my football helmet and I hit him smack dab on the nose and he fell back and got stuck between the locker and the bench and I just kept on swinging. No, that was only in my fantasies that I hit him. I knelt down and I took off his shoes, and it hurts every day of my life. My football career was over. I even got kicked out of school for a while because I quit going. That made sense. They kicked me out because I didn't show up. But people left me alone. Hey you, Mr. Smith, come here. I gotta talk to you. Yes, sir. Do you ever consider wrestling? That's how my wrestling career almost started. The coach must have seen some talent 
or more specifically, a 115-pound kid who thought that he was an athlete. The team needed lightweights, so I thought, oh, why not? Smith, you wrestle with Tommy here. He's a senior. He'll teach you the ropes. Ow! 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 Hey, let me go! Let me go! At least he didn't hit me in the head. I didn't know what it was about me. Was he that monster football player's friend or something? He wouldn't let me breathe, and I couldn't get away. So I sunk my teeth into his side, and I wouldn't let go. Stupid Indian! There went my wrestling career also. I didn't know that sports involved all that meanness. The senior basketball players would block the shower drains until the water rose to about four inches deep. Then they'd make the freshman boys swim in the shower crying, I'm a dying cockroach. Mr. Smith, from my reports, it doesn't look like you're going to make it through high school. Not unless you change your ways. I sure didn't understand this new school. I really was an idiot. All these Indian kids and hardly any of them going out for sports. There was something going on. We weren't exactly welcome at the school. Yes, ma'am. You're flunking algebra. Yes, ma'am. You're flunking Indian history. Yes, ma'am. In my defense, it was an old white guy teaching what looked like Indian geography. I wasn't learning anything about my history. This paper says that you sleep through all your classes. Yes, ma'am. I really had an excuse for this one. Mom and Dad were always fighting, and I was the non-paid referee. I'd sit by the steps every night until I heard them snoring. I didn't get much sleep. I was always afraid. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a football player. I want to go to college. I want to change the world. I want to make my life worthwhile. I always wanted to work in a gas station, I guess. We're going to concentrate on signing you up for industrial arts classes. Most of the kids from where you come from take these classes. They'll teach you to become a profitable part of our society. Yes, ma'am. I'll let you in on a secret. Yes, ma'am. We have a program here that'll get you through high school. It's called Cooperate and Graduate. Just keep your mouth shut, don't cause any trouble, and you don't have to do anything. The teachers will pass you just to get you through. Well, I raised the white flag. I surrendered. I gave up. That is until homecoming of my sophomore year. Kill the Indians! Kill, Kill the Indians! I love football. Heck, with having two alcoholic parents during the 1960s, the Packers and Vince Lombardi were all that I could count on. I just wasn't allowed to play it. I went to a bunch of the games. We were always the homecoming opponent. Kill the Indians! Kill the Indians! is what I always heard. And then it was our homecoming. We made a float, sophomore float, and a bunch of white kids dressed up like real television Indians and danced on the float. Boom, 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 boom. I couldn't take it any longer. At halftime, we were losing 34 to nothing. Zero. Zip. That's it, fella. And for halftime entertainment, the drums are playing boom, 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 boom. I made this. It's a hat with a stick hanging out. I glued a bunch of doll dresses to it. It's a headdress. I crawled underneath the stands, took out some lipstick, and put it on my face like war paint. Took off all my clothes, buck naked, and ran out onto the field and started dancing like a wild Indian. Everything froze. Time, space, the band. Then I started to run. What the hell do you think you were doing? Dancing like a real Indian. What? Dancing like a real Indian. David in your Bible dance naked. Are you crazy? How do you answer that? What the hell is that on your head? It's an authentic Indian headdress. Maybe a mini headdress. What do you mean authentic? Well, I'm a real Indian. I made it, so it must be authentic. I thought that the principal's head was going to explode. My dad was blowing snot balls out of his nose. He was laughing so hard when he saw me. Son? Yes, Dad? You had your reasons, right? Yes, Dad. Your mom's gonna be mad. 
He has stats. The one crazy Indian. Or one crazy Polak. Thank you, Dad. It's nice to be recognized in one's own time. It's so nice to have this time together doing my Carol Burnett imitation. This is what happens when you're a stupid Indian growing up during the 1970s. After that little stunt of dancing naked on the football field, the principal and I, well, let's just say that we spent a lot of time together and became real close over the years. You're in my seat. Remember that jerk who beat me up on the bus? Well, he had a cousin. You're in my seat. So every day I got on the bus to be bussed off the reservation to go to high school, which wasn't a problem, but at night, because I wasn't playing sports anymore, I had to ride the bus back to the reservation. You're in my seat. Every day I had to move my seat and get slapped upside the head by this Neanderthal with a four-word vocabulary. You're... Just a second, please. You see... Edgar Rice Burroughs, the guy who wrote Tarzan, also wrote about a land called Opar, which was inhabited by a race of men who were basically Neanderthals. How do I know this? I'll explain that later. Anyway, I swear that these cousins were direct descendants of these Neanderthal men. Big, hairy, and strong. I said, you're in my seat. Sorry, six words. So I moved. And if I didn't live 10 miles from the school, I would have just walked uphill both ways in a raging snowstorm to school each day. Hey, you! Vocabulary is expanding, excuse me, just a second. See, one day we had an assembly, and as I was leaving it, I just happened to be passing the principal when I heard someone say, I'm gonna get you. The more things change, the more things stay the same. For some strange reason, King Kong felt the urge to humiliate me in front of all of his friend. Did you notice friend wasn't plural? So he hits me right in the back of the head in front of the principal and basically the whole school. And the principal didn't do anything. You! Why does everybody feel the need to hit me in the head? You stupid Indian, I said. Now, I don't know what is worse, getting slapped upside the head or getting laughed at. I'm talking to you. Well, I guess that since he slapped me in the head every night on the bus, it must be getting laughed at. Ow! I kicked him right between the legs, right in front of the principal, right in front of the whole school. Then I jumped on him and prayed that the principal would pull me off before I got hurt. He did. And as a reward, we decided that I would spend every assembly during my high school years sitting in his office. Wasn't I special? You know, David, high school doesn't have to be a problem for you. How's that? You got some kind of special wash that'll turn me white? No! But, you know our school is named after and in honor of your people. My people? Stupid Indians? No, the Indians. So? We have this thing to honor your people. It's called Cooperate and Graduate. I know, I'm trying. The counselor told me. If you keep your mouth shut, don't get into trouble and set a good example for the other Indian kids, then you really don't have to do anything else to graduate. You mean behave, be good, and be quiet? Basically. And you don't even have to study. You will have to take some tests. The state demands that, but other than that, if you want to pass to the library every day, as long as you cooperate, you can have it. And there you have it. I spent most of my high school years reading in the library. I did have to take some tests, so I ended up graduating with a 1.878 GPA, but I never had to open a school book. The Indian logo on the school was just for show. The Indians inside of the school were mostly invisible. One nation, under God, invisible, you know. I graduated on the 4th, and I started this janitor's job on the 5th. 
thanks to affirmative action, the 5th of June, 1974, a day that will live in infamy throughout this Indian's history, and the day I decided that I never wanted to be a white man. Mr. David Smith? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Smith, I have you scheduled for a doctor's appointment at 3.30 this afternoon. But I'm not sick. You will be. It was weird walking out of the building having everyone laugh at me. I didn't know what was going to happen until I got to the doctor's office. Did you bring a specimen along with you? What type of specimen? Don't be cute. Give me your finger. Ow! Oh, what did you do that for? You didn't have to poke my finger with a needle. Haven't you been to a doctor before? I got shots. Take this cup and urinate it up to the marked line. Put the cover on the cup and then set the cup inside this little door. Yes, sir. Don't be cute. Then take off your clothes and put on this robe. All of my clothes? Don't be cute. You may leave on your shorts. Excuse me for a second while I take my clothes off behind this curtain. Mr. Smith! Hey, Doc! Is there some sort of problem? I see that your shorts are covered in blood. Yes, I have a problem. Your nurse jabbed me in the finger with a needle, then she made me pee in a cup, and that's how I bled all over my shorts. I see. Take a deep breath. That's cold. Sorry. Now stand up straight, turn your head, and cough. <coughs> Very good. Drop your shorts, please. What, 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 why are you putting on a rubber glove? Mr. Smith, please turn around and bend over. What are you doing? You can't do Are you sick? Bend over, bend over. Get away from me. Oi, vey. That's from the Suish side of my Indian family. My dad always wondered if the Indian people were from one of the lost tribes of Israel. And there you have it. What I want to know is, what is wrong with you people? First, you snip, snip, snip on your baby boys. Did it ever occur to you that some of our most celebrated comedians are Jewish? What if Abraham's last name was indeed Brooks, as in Mel Brooks, and the 2,000-year-old man? What if, as a young man, he was involved with contests on the sand cliffs? What if his nickname was Shorty? What if that snip, snip, snip thing wasn't really a part of the covenant that he made? What if he just threw that in to see what would happen? Hmm. And then 5,000 years later, to get a job in the white man's world, you are sent to the doctor and <laughs> the word insert comes up. That word insert has got to be the scariest word in the English language. I could never figure out white people. Now I understand. You people have some strange traditions. Then when I got back to work, everybody laughed at me. I say I didn't know about that stuff. Then someone said the magic words, stupid Indian. Mr. Smith? Yes, ma'am? I see from your job application for the position of assistant building maintenance engineer that you've been working for the county for almost seven years now. Seven years on June 5th. With perfect attendance. Yes, ma'am. I'm never sick. The building superintendent said, that you volunteered to pull the computer wires for our new computer system and saved us over $75 an hour. Yes, ma'am. I was watching the computer people work at night and I figured that I could do the same work and I volunteered. It was easy. It wasn't rocket science. Well, you see, we have a small problem here. I won't go into the details, but we are willing to offer you a position in buildings and grounds, but we can't give you the title of assistant. I'm thinking the same old, same old, and yet I was never interested in being an assistant. Not only don't I look like Igor, but I don't like the abbreviation before my name. 
ASS period, David Smith. We can give you the position at the same rate of pay. You'll go from 403 an hour to 453 an hour, and your step raises will be in that classification. Wow, a 50 cent an hour raise, 20 bucks a week. The wife and family sure can use it, but we'll still qualify for commodity cheese. Thanks, Mr. Reagan. Anyway, $5 for taxes, $5 for an IRA, and $10 for the fan. Well, David, basically your job is, if anyone calls with a problem, you go and take care of it. This was great for a year or so. Thanks to public television, I did electrical work, plumbing, carpentry, took care of the boilers and the air conditioning and anything else that came up. Oh, and people started to like me, even going so far as to ask for me when they called. And that's when it started. David! Yes, boss. Who told you to fix that thermostat in the county clerk's office? Nobody told me to. I was just walking past. You know that I don't like her, the county clerk. She's not a nice person. I don't want you doing anything around here unless you ask me first. Anything? Yes, I said anything. It started getting worse from there. I get called into the office and sit there while he lectured me until I figured out that his chair was higher than mine. So I started to just stand while he lectured me and soon that stopped. But it was all like a slap in the head and then it snowed. Oh, hello. <clears throat> what is it? Hey, boss, it's me, David. Hey, it's snowing. Should I come in early to shovel? What time is it? It's 4 a.m., boss. This is the time I usually come to work when it's snowing. It's 4 o'clock in the morning? What the hell are you calling me for? You told me to call you before I did anything. You know your job. Don't ever call me again. The next week there was a posting at work looking to hire an assistant building engineer at the same pay that I was getting. I applied. I was already doing the job. The boss said that I gave the best interview, but they hired someone else. I don't know why. But I was too busy to worry. The kids, the family life. I had started night school because I wanted to show the kids just how important I thought education was. What could I do about it anyway? David, this is your new boss, Mr. Kent Burns. He was a carpenter and he has all his own tools. Kent was an okay guy. He did have a lot to learn about boilers and air conditioning, but he was fine. Maybe a little forward, bossy, but fine. But eventually the boss took a dislike to him. The county needed two cabinets made, one for the computer and another for a television VCR for the helpline that operated 24 hours a day. Kent and I each had to build one. I built mine in a day and the next day varnished it. On the third day I delivered it. Kent had it started by the third day. They fired him. Congratulations, David. For what? You had the best interview for the assistant building supervisor. You outworked the person that they hired. The boss said that you have the job. I started jumping up and down. I got the job. All right. I didn't actually jump up and down like this, but inside I was. This was a step, an opening. American dream lives. Oh, I'm sorry, David. They hired someone else. I asked why. They said he had more experience. He didn't. But he was blonde and blue-eyed and ran his own construction business, a one-man operation. I had only done the job for seven years. So much for experience. And he had his own tools. Ronnie Reagan, I guess, shut down most of the county hospitals and sanitariums. That's what we heard. 
Our sanitarium was shut down and turned into a county office space. One problem was that there was groundwater leaking into the sewer system from the sanitarium to the main sewer line about 2,500 feet away. There were three elaborate manholes that were between the sanitarium and the main sewer line. David, I have a project for you. The powers that be had decided that the manhole enclosure that the sewer line ran through had to be leaking in groundwater. Someone, guess who, had to go into the manholes and mortar the walls with mortar cement and a trowel so the water didn't leak in. I bought you the supplies. You just go down inside the manhole and do the work. I'll check on you from time to time. Hey, hey up there. Is anybody there? Yeah, I'm back. What do you want? Hey, isn't this a confined space? Are we supposed to have special trains work in a confined space? Oh, I've got all the training. Like CPR and all that? And shouldn't I have a harness or something to pull me out in case something happens? Don't worry. Nothing's going to happen. And if anything does happen down there, you're just going to be one dead Indian anyway. Who's going to believe that something like that really happened? And it really happened. One dead Indian. But he had his own tools. Great. Time for me to look for a different job. So I applied at the highway department, asking for a transfer from the courthouse. I go back to being a janitor, but their union was paying more money and I get a chance to advance basically because of the union. David, as head of human resources, I've personally looked into it. I'm sorry, but your job description doesn't match up with the job opening at the highway department. I'm afraid you did not get the job. Now I don't even qualify for a janitor's job? Maybe I am a stupid Indian. I kept my mouth shut because who's going to believe me anyway? Don't get me wrong, I was very upset. I had all the qualifications to advance in any job at the county. I was going to night school, taking two classes a semester, and basically getting straight A's. I was doing all the electrical work for the county, running all the computer lines, doing plumbing, and after all those years of working as a janitor, now I don't even qualify for a janitor's work. But away from work, I had a great life, wonderful wife. Wonderful family. We were respected in town. I taught Sunday school with my wife. I was on the church board and she was on the library board. The kids were all honor students and great athletes. In the summer, I played on a softball team. And now, batting leadoff, David Smith. The pitch, the swing, it might be, it could be. Holy cow! <laughs> okay, I'm a Cubby fan. Hitting the baseball is a great way to relieve stress. I needed to relieve stress after being turned down continually for a janitor's job. One night about this time, we were at a tournament. We stopped for a beer and a hamburger before heading home. You know how it goes. Shooting pool, I was winning. I was controlling the table. Buck a game. Nothing big time. We were shooting against some young dudes who were obviously trying to impress their girlfriends. Now I can shoot pool when I want to. Granted, I have to get serious, and maybe I'm not so nice when I'm serious. But I think the eight ball to win again, and what does he say but... <coughs> Stupid! <coughs> Indian! <coughs> I just about had my fill of that. So I walks up to him and this girl gets in my way. You're not gonna fight? I gently placed my left hand on top of her head, smiled and said, Oh yes we are. And I nailed her boyfriend right over the top of her. He went down like a sack of potatoes. Next thing I know, his buddy bounces his cue stick off the side of my head. But I must have ducked just right. I hit him with my left hand and bam, he goes down. Then all hell breaks loose and it's like I'm in the middle of a John Wayne movie. I'm up against the wall swinging and kicking when all of a sudden the cops show up. Okay, okay, everybody out. Break it up. Break it up. Go stand over there. Great, now I'm going to get busted. 
I'll probably get fired because I have to work in the jail in the 911 communication center. So I'm standing there watching the bar empty out. I lit up a cigarette. I smoked at the time. When I had a Ford light bulb moment. Let's go, I said to the guy I was with. What do you mean, let's go? The cops told us to stand over here. They didn't say we had to stay here, so we just walked away. Actually, we walked about 20 feet, and then we ran like hell. That was a rough night. The fight was awesome. I felt full of power. I dropped my teammate off and driving home. I had to stop and walk in a field. Then I felt like a little kid, overcome. No, I felt like a baby. I started crying. I was down on my knees with my head in my hands, screaming, why, why? I felt like a fool. Why do I have to be a stupid Indian? I try to do everything right and nothing works out. I know it sounds as if I feel sorry for myself, but I feel more sorry for my family. They should be reaping the rewards of my hard work. Instead, we live paycheck to paycheck. We do without. I felt like I was in grade school and crying in my pillow. Why don't I fit in? Damn stupid Indian. After applying for three Janter Night Watchman positions at the highway department, entry-level positions, I might add, this is what I was told each time I was turned down. David, your job descriptions just don't match up. I do all the county's electric work. Even though I'm not licensed, I was told the county doesn't have to use licensed electricians. I do most of the plumbing and air conditioning, plus I'm an Indian. If anyone is qualified to be a janitor, it's me. David, I'm sorry. Your job descriptions just don't match up. So one day I'm working in her office. We got a new phone system and I had to rewire all of the phones. She gets up to leave and I hear her say that she'll be gone the rest of the day. So I start working on her secretary's phone and I offhandedly asked to see my job description. She went to the files and was gone quite a while. It appears that we don't have a job description for your position. Oh, thanks for looking. So I went to this affirmative action committee meeting and explained what my job entails and how I can't get a job as a janitor at the highway department. I told you, Mr. Smith, I told you three times that your job description just doesn't match up to the highway department's job posting. Could you show the committee my job description, please? This is how she left the room. Stomp, stomp, stomp. And you could almost hear her mumbling, stupid Indian, stupid Indian, stupid Indian. And then this is how she came dragging back into the meeting. Hey, oh, hey, oh having to admit that there wasn't a job description for me. I thought that I had won, but I lost. I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, but the highway department was going to fill two vacancies, but they only filled one. You were the second choice, but make sure you keep on applying. This went on for three years after that fateful day when she was ready to kill me in front of the Affirmative Action Committee. A lady lawyer from the local college contacted me and said I should contact the ACLU. So reluctantly I did, but they don't want to really help people who want to be janters, I guess. I didn't understand. I'm sorry, David. The department was going to hire for three positions, but they only hired for two. You were the third choice. But here's where it was different. But if the new hire quits, then the job is yours. The sun broke out, the clouds parted. It was an opening, a crack in the veneer. It was hope crawling out of Pandora's box. Maybe it was only a pipe dream, but for a class of people not allowed to dream, hey, stranger things have happened. As time would have it, we had to fill the courthouse vehicles with fuel at the highway department. This was three or four weeks later when an orange truck comes driving up to me. Hey, are you the Indian from the courthouse who's trying to get in here? I shook my head, a little hesitant. Yes. Rumor has it 
that they told you that you're next in line if me or Tommy quits before our probation is over. Rumor has it. I married an Indian gal. Tommy just quit. You get back to that courthouse right now. Then he winked and smiled at me and drove off. I felt like Geronimo when he jumped off the big cliff yelling, Me! What can I do for you, David? I just wanted to double check. Because I hate getting my hopes up. But you did say that I was a third choice at the highway. But if either of the two other guys quits, then I get the job, right? I have explained this how many times? Yes, you were the third choice. But if one of the other men quits, then you'll get the job. Yes! Tommy the watchman you just hired just quit. Now I get the job. There was a lot of coughing and hacking. Snot balls were flying from her nose into her desk. If she had dentures, they'd have flown right out. Bottom line, I got the job. I was dancing so much, it rained for three days straight. Oh, and here we are, 30 years later. I turn 60 next month, and I'll celebrate my 42-year anniversary with the county. I'm as high as I can get here at the highway department. We had a union and test for job promotions, so they couldn't keep me too far down. They tried. I'm the only minority working here. They don't even hire women for the summer help anymore because someone in management couldn't handle female co-workers. Or maybe they attempted to handle them too much. They won't let me into management, but I'm the highest paid hourly worker and the highest paid foreman. They didn't even want me to be a foreman, but I had the highest test scores three times and finally the most seniority. That didn't stop them from asking me not to take the job. They wanted to give it to someone who had the same last name as a supervisor. Imagine that. Thank the Lord for the union. They still play games. I just put in a giant culvert, eight foot round and 70 feet long set at an angle. It was a deep one, and now my boss says that it was set two feet off center. I helped him measure it. I held the dummy end of the tape and he took the readings, but he blamed me for the culvert being two feet off center. Heck, I read everything off his benchmark and re his reaction was, Oh my lord, you did it just like I told you to. So now I'm the highest paid county employee who's a flag man. It's called games, punishment. That's it. Now I'm ready to retire. I don't really want to, but I'm getting tired of fighting all the time. I think we should do things right. Do them right the first time. Instead, new leadership promotes just getting it done. If you want it nice, we'll do it twice, I've heard it said about them. Wasting government money. But they took the unions away, and the guys who do the work have no power. Oh well, life goes on. I'll get a full retirement package. This job has been good to me. I finally graduated from college. 20 years of night school. Stupid Indian. And all of our kids graduate from college. The kids were one sixteenth shy of being Indians that could qualify for Indian aid for college. But we got them through anyway. They're all doing great. Stupid Indian. And now my wife is a freshman in college. Plus, that $5 I started socking away a long time ago has grown to over $32,000. I took a stock market class. Stupid Indian. Stop, stop, stop your car. Come on, can't you read? Oh man, you're on your cell phone. What do you mean I'm number one? Hey, pal, you're using the wrong finger. Cum laude, 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 I graduated from college. Cum laude, 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 directing traffic today. Cum laude, 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 I graduated from college. Cum laude, 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 I guess they win today. Cotton picking songs that they taught in grade school. No, no, they don't win. They can't win. This is America. This is Turtle Island. I can be anything that I want. And I'm Superman. An Indian Superman. Fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. The Native American way.
We hope you have enjoyed this production of Little Boy Lost, Stupid Indian by Lewis V. Clark III, Two Shoes. The show was directed by Ryan Wynn. It was recorded, edited, and mixed by me, Sabrina Hemken. Original music written by Jordan Clark and Lewis V. Clark III, performed by Jordan Clark. Photos for the accompanying video provided were by Lewis V. Clark III. This program was produced by College of Menominee Nation with the financial support of the Oneida Arts Program. For more information about College of Menominee Nation, please visit us online at menominee.edu.